Okay, I'm going to start this morning by welcoming all of you guys. Sawadee Kaap, Sawadee Kaap, welcome to all of you guys. Nice to see you here this morning. We're going to start our morning with breathing mindfulness meditation like we do often, and I'll guide you guys in this practice, and then we're going to move into some discussions that we have today to share the teachings of the Buddha with you guys, now moving into more of the teachings that it takes in order to get to this first stage of enlightenment. We're going to be starting with chanting and easing the mind into meditation with chanting. You'll see those on a laminated sheet on the table over there that you guys are welcome to get if you like. You'll see that these chants are in the Pali language. Remember, the chanting was used during the lifetime of the Buddha as a way to commit the teachings to memory that he taught everything orally and people recited his teachings in order to commit them to memory. These particular chants, I don't suspect that the Buddha actually created himself because as you see, there's a lot of admiration and respect for the Buddha and a Buddha has already eliminated their ego. They're not going to go around being arrogant and boastful and asking people to chant these things to them. So these chants, they're nothing mystical or magical. It's not prayer. It's not worship. It's not a rite or ritual or ceremony just to help ease the mind into meditation and get more benefit out of the meditation itself. So I'll guide you guys in the chanting and you guys are welcome to chant along. Keep in mind that my voice is pretty scratchy with this uh, cold. So I heard some of you guys chanting. It sounds really beautiful. So if you guys would like to pick up a mic and chant with the mic, that'd be great. Uh, feel free to do that. Then I'll provide you some guidance on the breathing mindfulness meditation. Then we'll have that period of time where we'll just be meditating and then we'll come out with some chanting as well. So if you'd like to make a, yourself comfortable on the floor or in a chair or doing a lying position or standing position, it's really up to you. So let's go ahead and do some meditation and then uh, we'll be off to learning some of the teachings of the Buddha. Arahant Sawakato Mahakavata Sawaka Sangho Sangha Namami Napmurasa Pakawato Arato Samasaputasa Napmurasa Pakawato Arato Samasaputasa Napmurasa Pakawato Arato Sama Saputasa Iti Piso Makawa Arahang Sama Samuoto we chajaranang samuro Sakato roka wito Anu tero purisa Dama sati sata tawa manu asran Poto pakawati Okay, with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable 
in the upper body erect. Just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose. Experiencing the full breath. And then, whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, breathe in gradually through the nose, establishing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then, whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in and out. Breathing in. And out. Once the breath is well established, start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in. And out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go anytime the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. 
No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in. And out.
I will uh, once again welcome all of you guys, including those of you guys that joined us as we started meditating. Welcome to all of you guys. Those of you guys that are here and those of you guys that are online, welcome to everyone. We're going to be continuing our retreat by helping you guys to understand more about the path to enlightenment as it relates to getting to the first stage of enlightenment. Getting to the first stage of enlightenment is to have all the teachings that you need to be able to then make your way to enlightenment itself. By the time you get to the first stage of enlightenment, as we talked on the first day, it's like getting to base camp of Mount Everest. When you get to base camp at Mount Everest, you still need to get to the summit. But by the time you get to base camp at Mount Everest, you've acquired a certain amount of wisdom and a certain amount of knowledge and equipment to be able to then make your way to the summit that you've probably gone on many other hikes, many other trails. You've tried out many different equipment. You have certain wisdom that's going to allow you to then make your way to the summit of Mount Everest. You don't just show up to the base camp of Mount Everest uh, by mistake. It's not something you just stumble into. You need to intentionally make your way to base camp at Mount Everest so that you can then get to the summit. Well, getting to the first stage of enlightenment is the same way. You're not going to just stumble into it. You're going to need to actively learn and actively grow. And there are certain teachings that you need in order to make your way to that first stage of enlightenment. And once you get to the first stage of enlightenment, you'll have what you need to then make your way to enlightenment itself. You're still going to need guidance. You're going to still need learning and developing from that point, but you'll have essentially everything you need to then make your way to enlightenment. One of the things that you're going to need to know is what we're going to be talking about today. A lot of the things actually of what we're going to be talking about today is what you're going to need. This first topic that we're discussing is called understanding human beings, the five aggregates and the six sense spaces. Remember also that what the Buddha taught is the natural laws of existence. 
He didn't teach a bunch of rules and commandments. He didn't teach the way the world should be. He didn't give a bunch of rules that if everybody followed these rules, then we'll all be peaceful. Instead, he's explaining to you the way the world is. And by understanding the way the world is and you understanding this wisdom, you can then navigate it more readily because you'll understand the natural laws of existence. One of the things that you need to understand is this being who you are, this human being that right now you're in this human existence. And if you don't understand this human being and how this human being functions and what you're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis to the, to the various things that are going on with this human being, you wouldn't be able to make your way to this enlightened mental state where the mind can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently for the rest of this life. So these two teachings, the five aggregates and the six sense bases are going to help you understand this being who you are now so that then by understanding this being, you can now train the mind to be able to navigate this world more readily. So as we go, just like always, you're welcome to ask any and all questions. Those of you guys here at the temple, if you could use the microphones here so the people online can hear you, there's a gray switch on the front. You just press that. And once the light comes on, it takes about a second for the mic to engage. And if you hold that up to your chin, then the people will be able to hear you online. will be able to hear you here as well. And for those of you guys online, you can ask questions by putting that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions that you like. So first, let's talk about what the five aggregates are. Some people refer to these as the five collections or the five elements. These are the five things that describe what a human being is. And this is important for you for a reason, but let's first talk about what they are and then I'll explain to you why you need to understand these. So first, the five aggregates are form, feelings, perceptions, volitional formations, and consciousness. These are the five things that make a living being. A living being is gonna have physical form, and by, as I'm teaching you this, you can independently reflect on this and verify this, right? Because I teach you not to believe any of the teachings of the Buddha. Don't believe anything I say. So as I teach this, you know you're a living being. So you can reflect on this and see whether it's true or not. So if living being is going to have physical form, there's going to be physical structure to the body. That's the first aggregate. The second one is feelings. These are results and experiences in the mind based on the six sense bases, which you're going to learn in a moment. But just heads up, the six sense bases are the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and then the mind itself. These are the ways that the mind takes in certain contact and experiences things in the world. And based on the things that you experience, you're going to form certain feelings in the mind. This is what a living being is going to experience. It's going to have certain feelings, either pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. These are conditioned feelings. This is what a unenlightened being is experiencing, it's these conditioned feelings. Then there's certain perceptions. What a perception is, is a belief or opinion of how things seem to be. Oftentimes, these are assumptions that an individual is making. Then there's something called volitional formations. These are choices and decisions, intentional decisions that you're making. A living being is going to be able to make intentional decisions. They're going to have free will. Then there's something called consciousness. This is the mind. You can think of the mind like a container. I think of it like a cardboard box. And then there's certain contents that are inside this cardboard box. So these are the five aggregates, form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. And it's important to understand these five things because in addition to all the other craving and clinging that the unenlightened mind does and that you're going to need to eradicate in order to get to enlightenment, like not cling to a relationship or not cling to a piece of cake or not cling to this or that. You're going to need to learn what these things are so you don't cling to these things. That oftentimes in the unenlightened state, the mind is clinging to these things. So for example, let's take the physical body, the physical form. If you're clinging to this physical form, thinking that this is who you are, when you see a wrinkle, when you see a pimple, when you see a gray hair, if you're losing your hair, something like this, you get a little extra fat here and there, you might be shaken up by that. You might experience sadness or frustration or agitation or annoyance, or you might feel embarrassed or something like this. So if you're clinging to this physical form, wanting it to be permanent, it's not permanent. So therefore, when it starts changing, your mind's going to experience those painful feelings. So you need to get to the point where you're no longer clinging to this physical form, thinking that this is who you are. 
Then the same thing with the feelings. There's oftentimes the mind can cling to these feelings of pleasant feelings, painful feelings, or neither painful nor pleasant. So in the present moment, you can be clinging to feelings or situations that occurred in the past. And now in the present moment, when those feelings are arising of pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, the mind can cling to these feelings, wanting them to be permanent or something in the future. The mind can be longing and yearning for that. And now in the present moment, there are certain feelings. So you're going to need to get to the point where you recognize that these feelings are temporary. They're impermanent. They're going to arise. They're going to change and they're going to fade away. And if you try to cling to them, then you're just setting yourself up for more discontentedness because they're going to eventually fade away. Then there's certain perceptions or beliefs and opinions of how things seem to be in the world. If you cling to any of your perceptions, you're going to tend to make unwise decisions because oftentimes your perceptions are false truths. That if you cling to these assumptions or perceptions, you're going to be making decisions in the world that can lead you down a path of unwise decisions that produce unwholesome results. I'll give you an example of this. Police officers, when they're trained, they're trained to not cling to their perceptions. Like, let's say you get a call over the radio as a police officer and they say, okay, there's a robbery at this 7-Eleven down the street. We need you to go down there to the 7-Eleven and take care of this robbery. Well, maybe the police officer makes their way down there. They walk into the police, into the 7-Eleven, and they see a person in a black hoodie with a gun over top of somebody laying on the floor that has a gunshot wound and they're bleeding out. If this police officer clings to their perception, they might walk in and start shooting the person in the black hoodie. But the person in the black hoodie could be a customer or it could be the cashier. And now if the police officer shoots that person, they've just shot the innocent person. Maybe the robber is the one on the floor. The police officer showing up, they don't know what's going on in this environment. They're just got the call that there's a robbery at this 7-Eleven. They don't know who's who. So if you cling to a perception, that means when you walk in, you could actually be killing an innocent person and now you go to jail because as a police officer, you are clinging to your perceptions. So you're going to need to practice not clinging to your perceptions, whether it's with your life partner, whether it's your children, whether it's your coworkers or friends or family, you might fall certain perceptions in your mind of the way you think things should be or the way things are and then you might realize that that's not actually true so one of the ways to ensure you're not clinging to your perceptions is to ask questions so what a police officer is going to do as soon as they walk in and see that person with the black hoodie holding the gun they're probably going to pull out their own gun and say put down the gun put down the gun Right. And if it's an innocent person, seeing that there's a police officer there, they would put down their gun readily and easily. No problem. But if it's a person who's there to cause harm, they would probably turn and point the gun to the police officer. And then that's when the person's going to get shot. Right. So you need to be sure you're not clinging to your perceptions by asking questions to certain situations. If you guys have been around kids, you know that you might walk into a room and see something going on and you don't know necessarily what's happened or what transpired before you got there. And you're going to need to ask questions to understand what's transpired. This way you're not clinging to your perception. And then any decisions that you make from that point forward can be based in truth rather than based on your perceptions. Because if you cling to a an assumption or you hold on to a perception, you could make an unwise decision that ends up in causing all kinds of unwholesome results for you because you're making decisions based on false truths. They're not actually true. It's not a real true thing. It's just a perception. It's just an assumption. This fourth aggregate or fourth collection or fourth element is called volitional formations. This is just a fancy way of saying choices and decisions. So a volitional formation is any decision or choice that you're making. You're going to need to learn to not cling to these as well. Let me give you an example of this. Say that you were made a decision that you're going to travel to South America and you're going to go to Brazil and you're here in Thailand and now you're making a decision to go to Brazil because you live here in Thailand. And now uh, you've booked these flight, this flight out three months or six months from now. And now you're so excited to go on this trip to Brazil. Well, now as you get closer and closer to your trip, maybe the airline goes on strike and now you can't actually get out of the airport because the 
the airplanes aren't traveling. Well, if you cling to your decision, you're going to be angry. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be agitated because you've been holding on to this decision. You've been so excited to go to Brazil. And now because of impermanence affecting this decision that you can't go to Brazil any longer because of the impermanence of the air travel, now you're going to be angry or frustrated or irritated. So you're going to need to learn not to cling to your decisions, any decisions that you make that as impermanence happens, you're going to need to be able to ebb and flow with those decisions. So you might make a certain plan to do something and then that may or may not even occur. I'll give you an example from my life. About a year or so ago, there were some students from America that asked me to come and teach a retreat in America. <coughs> and I said, sure, sounds good. I'll come. And there was like a 10 month period of time where they were doing all this planning and they were trying to raise funds to be able to support, to be able to host this retreat at a temple in, uh, in America. Well, as we got closer and closer, we were about two months out and they didn't have enough support. They didn't have what they needed and they needed to let go of that decision. Right? Whereas if you're clinging to that decision, even something like a retreat, then you're going to be really frustrated. You're going to be really angry, really annoyed. Maybe you even uh, extend yourself in terms of your finances and maybe somebody gives a huge amount of money just to make sure this retreat happens and now they don't have the money that they need in order to sustain their life. So if you cling to your decisions, you'll oftentimes make unwise decisions because your craving is in there, your longing, your yearning, you're wanting things to be a certain way. Or here's another example. Say you've had a challenge in the past with substance abuse and now you've made all kinds of unwise decisions in the past and you're clinging to those decisions now thinking of yourself as a miserable person because of the unwise things you did in the past. Maybe you're identifying with who you are as a person based on things that you did in the past. And now in the present moment, you feel sad or you feel frustrated or you feel disappointed in yourself or stress or anxiety because of certain decisions that you made in the past. <coughs> It's important to understand that the decisions that you made and whatever you decided, that doesn't define who you are. We might have made decisions in the past to use alcohol or to use drugs, but that doesn't mean that we're a bad person or that, uh, you know, those decisions define us. Sometimes when we go away to places like AA or NA, they teach you to say, I am an alcoholic or I am an addict. And this is helpful when you're first getting started in order to ensure that you're never going back to that again. But I would advise you not to identify as that, that, that don't identify with I am an alcoholic or I am an addict because that's identifying with decisions that you made in the past as being who you are as a person. And this would be unwise. So clinging to these decisions that you've made in the past can cause you to make unwise decisions about certain things that you're doing now or certain ways that you think about yourself. So you'll need to see that the decisions are the decisions and they're either going to be wise or unwise. And if you've made unwise decisions in the past, which we all have, don't allow your mind to identify with you, yourself and who you are based on those unwise decisions. Oftentimes, that's the way that we cultivate wisdom is by making unwise decisions. And then we see the unwholesome results that we experience due to those unwise decisions, and it helps us to cultivate wisdom. So if your goal in this life is to always cultivate wisdom, then you can never fail because no matter what decisions that you make, whether they're wise or unwise, you're learning. So even in situations where you make unwise decisions and you experience unwholesome results, you can use that as an opportunity to cultivate wisdom about what's going on with this natural laws of existence because the natural law of gamma is the most unbiased teacher that you'll ever find. It's going to show you exactly where you've made a wise decision or an unwise decision. If you have made any kind of unwise decision, you're going to experience an unwholesome result. And one of the students sent me a, a message today. Jeannie sent me a message and asked me to ask this question during the class. So I will answer this for her. She's online on YouTube, I think. She said that she had a friend who injured themselves and uh, she practiced generosity to give them this uh, topper, this bed topper, because she knew that it would help them because they were in a lot of pain. And she felt like she could give this to them. And she was going to give it to them anyway when she leaves Chiang Mai. But now, because of her own back, she's experiencing pain in her back. And this is why she's not here in class today, right? So she asked me, is this a wise decision or was this an unwise decision?
decision. Well, the natural law of karma is always there showing you about your decisions and teaching you whether you've made a wise or unwise decision. This, what she's experiencing is an unwholesome result of an unwise decision where she practiced generosity, but there was a certain unwise aspect of how she was practicing generosity. If it was me, what I would have done if I was interested in getting this person a topper for their bed and I knew that I needed one too, I would have just went out and bought one and then given it to that person. And then I would have also had a topper for my bed as well. So you can practice generosity with craving, desire, attachment. If there's any kind of craving, desire, attachment in there in the mind, it's not yet pure generosity. So while generosity leads to wholesome results, you need to practice generosity from the middle way as well, where there isn't craving, desire, attachment. So rather than hurrying up and giving that bed topper to to your friend, what you could have done is just taking some time, go to the store, buy a new one, and then giving it to that person. And then, of course, you probably are, you know, you were planning to give them your bed topper, right? But you're not ready to let go of it yet because you still need it here in Chiang Mai. So if you're going to do something like that, whenever you're practicing loving kindness and compassion, you need to have for this being first. You can't practice loving kindness and compassion for others without first practicing loving kindness and compassion for this being who you are. And the same thing with generosity. If you're practicing generosity that leaves you unwhole, meaning you know, your back is now hurting, then you're not going to be whole yourself. So you need to be sure that you've taken care of your basic needs and necessities before you look to share with other people. So that's very important. And the Buddha even talks about this when he teaches generosity. He talks about taking care of yourself and taking care of the people around you, like your relatives, your workers, uh, employees, people like this. And then he talks about expanding it from there. And there's a discourse where he describes this. And he puts himself as last in terms of practicing generosity because people were practicing generosity with him as well. And he put himself as last because he knew that if you weren't taking care of your own basic necessities to sustain your life, giving to him isn't going to be helpful for you because you need food, you need water, you need clothing, you need shelter, you need medical care. And if you're not whole, then you're not going to be able to sustain your life. So the decisions you make are going to either be wise or unwise. And no matter what decision you make, even when you're planning for the future, you need to be sure that you don't cling to it. Whether it's a decision that you've made that's going to be three or six months from now, or even three to six minutes from now. You guys saw in the excursions that we've been taking that there's been some decisions that we've made and then we've had to let them go and change our decision and change our decision and change our decision and ultimately we got to the ultimate goal that we were looking to accomplish but we've had to change our decision a few times on all these various excursions that we're taking and this is the benefit of not clinging to any one particular decision that then as impermanence is happening and you're experiencing something new you can change your decision so like yesterday when we left to go to the orphanage, the goal was to go to the market over by the U.S. consulate. And when we showed up there, we had 18 people, which I didn't know how many people we were going to have when I planned it several months ago. We had 18 people. And then when we got there, I noticed that there was so many people at the market that it would be unwise for us to try to take these 18 people who've never been to this market before and teach you guys how to Con, you know, conduct uh, business in this market and actually acquire the things we need because things are really spread out really far. We'd have to be walking really far back and forth. So that's when I saw all of those people there and I knew we had all these people in the present moment, we could let go of that old decision and then we can make a new decision, which was we went to macro and you see that worked out a lot better for us because then it was a store where things were more consolidated and we could kind of split off into groups and buy things. So if you cling to a decision, you could be walking yourself through some really unwholesome results because you're still clinging to a certain decision. So you're going to need to let go of certain decisions that you make and feel comfortable in doing that and not just holding on to it because you've planned it for six months or 10, 10 months. Like this retreat that was in America, when it, whenever I plan something in the future, I already know in my mind that it may or may not happen. And I let the students know that when they planned this retreat, they started talking about it. I said, okay, great. You guys can plan this retreat. I will be there, but just keep in mind, it may or may not happen, right? So we can also oftentimes plan towards something. And then as we get closer and closer to it, as impermanence is happening, we can make a revised decision 
if we're not clinging to our current decision. You can easily let that go and then make a wiser decision in the present moment based on the facts that you have. No longer clinging to your decisions, but also not clinging to your perceptions and not clinging to any feelings that you might be having if you've got pleasant feelings like, oh, yes, we're going to have this retreat in America. Oh, it's going to be so fun. Yeah, I can't wait. Yay. Right. So if we're clinging to any of these things, it's going to lead you towards unwholesome results. Then there's the consciousness. The consciousness is the mind itself. Inside the mind, you have these various things of feelings, perceptions, volitional formations. Those are all inside the mind. The consciousness not only has these things, but it's oftentimes holding on to a certain identity, like I am American, or I am a Buddhist teacher, or I am Belgian, or I am uh, Mexican, or I am Japanese, or I am Irish, or I am Italian, right? I, I am, I am. It could be your culture, it could be your ethnicity, your sexual orientation, your uh, job or occupation. The mind can cling to these certain things that are in there. Not only the feelings, not only the perceptions, not only the volitional formations, but a certain identity. And if you cling to this identity, you're setting yourself up for discontentedness. So you're going to need to get to the point where you're not clinging to the identity, thinking that this is who you are. So you might be performing a certain role, but that's not who you are. So if I was a police officer and I clung to this thinking I am a police officer, then when I retire, I will really struggle. I will think like a part of me is missing. And I will feel not whole. I will feel not complete. Or if you've ever been in a relationship, like a boyfriend or girlfriend, and you guys separated, you might have felt like you wanted to hurry up and get right back into another relationship because you weren't comfortable in that role of being single, that your mind identified with, I am a boyfriend, or I am a girlfriend, or I am a husband, or I am a wife. And now when you're not that anymore, you don't feel whole, you don't feel complete. So you might have felt like you wanted to hurry up and get right back into another relationship. Or if you identify with, I am American, or I am Belgium, or I am Mexican, or I am Japanese, or I am Italian, or I am Chinese. If you have any of this, I am around your nationality, when somebody says something agreeable to you about your nationality, you'll get those conditioned pleasant feelings. But then when somebody says something degrading and disparaging, then you're going to experience painful feelings. And you can't control what other people are doing. You can't control that if you're at a restaurant and two tables over, they're disparaging the people that come from the country that you come from. You can't control that. All you can do is control your own mind. So the Buddha is not teaching you the way the world should be. It would be wise, yes, if that person didn't speak in disparaging and degrading ways about people from various countries. But the fact is, is that there's craving, anger, and this unknowing of true reality or this ignorance in the mind of many human beings. And because of impermanence, not everybody's going to view people from your country in a positive way. Some people are going to view people from your country in a negative way. And that's their perception. That's their opinion. That's their view. But you don't need to identify with that. So that way your mind doesn't get shaken up. So if there's any kind of identity that you're holding on to, you can be shaken up in these situations. I was talking to a student recently who uh, identifies with, I am a good tipper. I am a good tipper, right? And they tip really uh, well when they go around to different restaurants and different venues. And they were saying that when they are now going to places where they typically don't tip, that they're those people are asking for tips and they say they feel bad because they're not tipping and they're choosing not to tip. And this is because of their identity. They identify with, I am a good tipper. And now in this situation, they're choosing not to tip because they're saying it's just like a 30 second transaction at a cashier. And this cashier is asking for a tip and they're saying, Hey, I'm a generous person. I practice generosity in many different places, but I'm really conflicted here because these people are asking me for tips and I don't think I should have to tip. You know, it's not something that I, I feel like I would like to do, but because their mind is holding on to this identity of, I am a good tipper. They're really struggling in those situations where they're choosing not to tip. So your mind can cling to all kinds of identity and you're going to need to let that go and not cling to this consciousness thinking that this is who you are. As long as you're clinging to any of these aggregates, then you're opening yourself up to discontentedness, either conditioned feelings of pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. 
Now, let me share with you. Actually, let me back up. Do you guys have any questions on any of these aggregates? Yes, ma'am. Could you use the mics here? We have microphones so that people online can hear you. I apologize for my voice. My nose is really getting clogged up with this uh, cold. Uh, hello. Uh, I have two questions. It's about uh, generosity. Uh -huh. When we... If we see a baker on the street and we know who is professional baker and maybe he doesn't need this money but he's just lazy there, should we give them money? And if we, we start to think this is like we start to critical and the judgment one people. So it's quite a struggling. I don't know if... Sure. Yeah. And the, the, and the second is... Let me answer the first one first, okay. one at a time. Uh, <clears throat> so um, how you choose to practice is your choice. You're going to need to practice generosity in order to train your mind to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, and train it to let go. And how you decide to direct your generosity is up to you. And making wise decisions about where you direct your generosity can have more impact. So you can make wise decisions that is going to produce wholesome results with your generosity, but you could also make unwise decisions that produce unwholesome results. Even the Buddha talks about this. Like say, for example, you gave money to a monk that a monk was smoking. Maybe they're gambling. Maybe they're hitting dogs and beating up animals. The Buddha describes these kinds of things would be unwise to support this because that's where your money is going. It's not going to help the continuation of the teachings of the Buddha, for example. So this banker that you're describing or this individual, you need to decide for yourself whether it would be wise for you to um, uh, offer that generosity or not. Based on what you've shared, shared so far, I probably wouldn't if someone was just lazy and lethargic because that's not going to get them out of that state. Um, this is why, like, if I see uh, people that are homeless on the street, I typically won't give them money because sometimes they may be, uh, you know, addicted to a substance. And I've had people here in Thailand come up to me before and I could tell that they're addicted to a substance because you can smell it coming off of them. So I won't give them money. But what I'll do is I'll go to the store and get them food so that they, it can sustain their life. Right. So you need to decide for yourself how you're going to practice generosity, because all the variables are going to be different in each situation in terms of the people that you're potentially going to practice generosity with and your variables too about how much resources you have to be able to share. So you'll need to make wise decisions in those situations. You have a second one? You have to turn it on. I think you turned it off when, after you asked your first question, which was very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. I, I think it a lot of people have read a lot of uh, story about the Buddhism story is quite confused. It's like, I, I think I... The mic went out on us. I think the batteries uh, might have went out for some reason. There's some impermanence. We have new batteries. They might be getting, uh, they might be running out. We have, we have other mics that you can use and we can even change the batteries out of that mic. Oh. Yeah, I have been read uh, different um, Buddhism stories. It's one of the stories like a monster, maybe during his uh, meditation, <sighs> the, there is a tiger come and they're very hungry and uh, he give himself's body to the tiger to eat. Mm -hmm. Then the miracle happened, he become a saint or something. So it's like a very confused. This it, isn't a teaching of the Buddha. <laughs> yeah. You might have been exposed to this and it might have been attributed to the Buddha, but this isn't a teaching from the Buddha. <coughs> it would be unwise so to feed like yourself to a tiger. So it's like when he makes this decision, he knows he's going to hurt himself. He's going to yeah. harm himself. But, yeah. but for the normal people, when we see this, this situation, we won't do it because it's unwise. Right. But because he did this, so it's like a certain enlightenment. <laughs> so I don't know, he's quite confused. Yeah. yeah, that's not something that the Buddha taught. That's not enlightenment. That's an unwise decision to feed yourself to a tiger, 
right? This is oftentimes people come up with all kinds of different stories and all different kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, and uh, even you hold read on one second, s- one second. <laughs> all kinds of things that they attribute them to the Buddha, and that the Buddha has taught this particular thing. The goal isn't to become a saint, so to speak, of what you're describing. The goal is to train your mind now in this life in order to get to enlightenment, and you need to sustain your life in order to be able to get to this enlightened mental state. So even the Buddha, when he realized that he was starving himself and just eating one grain of rice per day, he realized that that was unwise and he started eating, even though everybody around him thought that the way to get to enlightenment was to starve the body and cause all these disparaging things to the body. He realized that it's unwise to cause physical pain to the body. So he made the choice to start eating, even though other people weren't really eating. So when you see these kinds of things, they're they're not what the Buddha actually taught, even if people are contribute or attributing it to the Buddha. Okay. Yeah. If you read the book series that I share, and you can get this online for free, or you can download it uh, and take it and go print it, or you can get printed copies here by reimbursing us for our printing costs, or you can get them on Amazon, you'll see the original words of the Buddha and what he actually taught. It has nothing to do with any of this kind of stuff. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Anything else you guys have questions about on the five aggregates? I don't see any questions. Let me check here online. Okay, so now let me explain to you why you're going to need to understand what these five aggregates are. That by learning the five aggregates, it's helped you to identify what a living being is so that you can more closely practice that first precept that we talked about with the five precepts and produce wholesome gamma. Remember that first precept, the Buddha talks about living compassionately for the welfare of all living beings. Well, how could you live compassionately for the welfare of all living beings if you didn't know what a living being was? So this is going to help you to eliminate anger, hatred, and ill will towards all living beings and cultivate this loving kindness and compassion towards all living beings. It's going to help you to eliminate the fetter, the taint, the pollution of ill will. There's 10 individual pollutions in the mind. That first precept, while the Buddha talks about not killing and you realize that, yes, that's a wise decision not to kill other beings. The reason reason why he's teaching you that is not as a rule, not as a commandment. He's teaching it to you to help you eliminate this fetter of ill will. Because in order to kill another being, there needs to be a certain amount of ill will potentially. Unless you're doing it out of self-protection and you're just trying to eliminate any kind of harm that this being is causing. You can actually kill another being without ill will, but if you're just intentionally killing without any other reason, then this is oftentimes coming from the ill will in the mind. So in order to practice living compassionately for the welfare of all living beings, you would need to know what a living being is. So that's why you need to know what the five aggregates are. And you need to know what the five aggregates are so that you don't cling to them, so that you can eliminate these two fetters, which are desire for form and desire for formless. These are the sixth and seventh fetter. What desire for form is, is where you desire or you, you crave to exist in the world. If you're clinging to any of these five aggregates, you're craving to exist in the world. That's what desire for form is, that you desire to be reborn into either the animal realm or the human realm. What desire for formless is, is desire to be reborn in one of the formless realms of hell, afflicted spirit, and heavenly realm. There are beings who desire to be in hell. There are beings who desire to be in the afflicted spirit realm. And there's beings who desire to be in the formless realm of heaven. And by the time you get to enlightenment, you need to eliminate any craving, desire, attachment for existence in any of these realms. But you also need to eliminate any craving for non-existence either. This would be like wanting to commit suicide, right? So by the time you get to enlightenment, you need to just be content in the present moment that yes, there is an existence here. And now I can be content and peaceful and joyful in this present moment that you're not craving existence, but you're not craving non-existence either. So if you're clinging to any of these five aggregates, which is this human being, you're holding on to this world, wanting to exist in the world. So you're going to need to know these five aggregates in order to accomplish the practice of 
the first precept to live compassionately and cultivate loving kindness for all living beings. And you're going to need it so that you can eliminate this fetter of desire for form and desire for formless. So this is going to help you to eliminate these two fetters, which are part of getting to enlightenment. Okay. So here's a little diagram that I created because oftentimes pictures help you to understand things a bit more than just text and things like this. So as I describe is that there is this physical body and then there's this mind and these two things came together and now we call that a person. So there's kind of three different things here. There's a body, there's a mind, and then the combination of these two things we call the person. So the body is the form aggregate. That's what the Buddha is describing as the form aggregate. <clears throat> inside the mind, there's feelings, perceptions, volitional formations, and consciousness. And it's the combination of these two things that we call a person. Okay. Any questions on the five aggregates at all? Yes, ma'am. So if I understand correctly, one has to let go of five, all five aggregates in order to get liberation. So how is that one clinches to consciousness? I'm sorry? How is that, that a person clinches to consciousness? How is like the consciousness clinging to itself? I don't understand that. Okay. So if you think about the, the mind like a container and then inside that has a certain contents, the mind is clinging to the contents. Right. So like the identity isn't the mind itself. It's a content inside the mind, inside the container. So it's like the box is clinging to the shoes. Right. So the box and the shoes are two different things. So the mind is one thing, but then the contents of the mind is something different. So the mind can cling to its self identity that it might have formed. So that's how it's clinging. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So where is the soul? The Buddha never taught that there is a soul or there isn't a soul. He left this as an undeclared teaching. There are some people that attribute the teaching of a soul to the Buddha, but he never actually taught that because it conflicts with his core and fundamental teachings on the universal truth of impermanence. This is like a very beginning teaching um, that things are constantly changing and there isn't this permanent thing that's going from one life to the next. And it also conflicts with his universal truth of non-self. These are part of what we call the three universal truths. So he has his declared teachings where he shares this is what I declared, but then you can see his undeclared teachings where he says, this I did not teach. This is my undeclared teachings. And whether there is a soul or there isn't a soul is an undeclared teaching. Even though people in Buddhist communities talk about a soul, the Buddha never actually taught this at all. Because we're 2,500 years away from the death of the Buddha, and very few people are studying with the original words of the Buddha, you'll see a lot of changes and a lot of modifications that people made to his teachings. And because of that, a lot of people are being hindered to be able to experience enlightenment. So what I do is I get back to the original teachings of the Buddha so that you can see what he actually taught and then also what he didn't teach. So that way you can understand that through learning, reflecting to independently verify and practice, and then you can experience the results of the enlightened mind. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions here. So now we're going to move into the six sense bases. Let's talk about what the six sense bases are. This is the method by which the mind longs and yearns. It experiences contact through these six sense bases. And it's going to view that contact as either agreeable or disagreeable based on its craving, desires, attachments. And now, because of this central desire that's in the mind, this fetter, this taint, or this pollution, it's going to experience discontentedness. So because of central desire that's inside the unenlightened mind, it's longing and yearning through the sense bases of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and then the mind itself. These are what's referred to as the internal sense bases. These are also referred to as the doorways to discontentedness because any discontentedness that you experience, it's going to come through one of these doorways. Then there's something called the external sense base, which is 
forms, the eye sees certain forms, then there's going to be certain sounds that the ear hears, then there's going to be certain odors that the nose experiences, then there's going to be certain flavors that the tongue tastes, then there's going to be certain physical objects that come in contact with the body, and then there's going to be certain mental objects. Okay, so let me give you some examples on these. Let's say that you see that it's sunny outside, you see the sun, and that's a physical form, and now that's agreeable to you. You'll experience conditioned pleasant feelings because you're seeing something through the eyes that is now agreeable to you. It's a physical form. But now, because of your craving, you experience frustration when you see the rain. You see the rain with your eyes, it's a physical form, and now that's disagreeable to you, so now you experience frustration. Or say that you see a child walking down the street with their parents and they're holding hands and it's like, ah, that looks so wonderful. Look at the child holding hands with its mom and dad. That's so heartwarming. Wow. You see this physical form that is agreeable to you based on your craving of wanting to see people be peaceful and joyful. Now you turn the corner and you see a parent slap their child across the face this could be disagreeable to you based on your craving of wanting to see everybody be peaceful and joyful. And now you might get frustrated or agitated or annoyed. We're not talking about what's wise or unwise in this situation. We're just talking about what's causing the discontentedness. It's the craving, desire, attachment in the mind, which is sensual desire, but it's taking in contact through the eye. And now, based on that contact, the unenlightened mind is going to see this contact as either agreeable or disagreeable. This physical form is either agreeable or disagreeable. So one of the other examples I commonly give is say you have a brand new car and now you've got this brand new sparkling, beautiful sports car. You park it outside the store and you feel so great because it's brand new and it's sparkling. It looks beautiful. But now you come outside and you see a scratch on your car. This scratch can be disagreeable to you based on your craving to keep this car looking permanently beautiful. And now that physical form that you're seeing through the eye, which is the scratch on the car, you now get frustrated or agitated or annoyed. Again, we're not talking about what's wise or unwise because it'd be wonderful if nobody ever scratched our car. But that's not the world we live in. We live in an impermanent world. We're going to experience scratches on our car. We're going to experience this impermanence. And as long as the mind is craving permanently agreeable contact through the eyes, you can only be happy or excited when you get things that are agreeable to you through the eyes. And when you see something that is disagreeable, you're going to experience the painful feelings. And now the same thing is happening with all these other sense bases the ears, the certain sounds that you hear that you see as agreeable, and there are certain sounds that you consider to be disagreeable. And when you hear agreeable sounds, you have contact with agreeable sounds, you'll get pleasant feelings. But if you have disagreeable contact, you have contact that you see as disagreeable, you'll get painful feelings. So let's say you're in a car, you're at a stoplight, it's a red light, someone pulls up next to you with music that you find to be pleasing and you like this music and you have a certain craving in there you're like yeah that's my jam all right let's go come on all right yeah that's good music all right but then you pull up to the next traffic light and now somebody else comes up next to you with other music that you don't like now you might get frustrated or agitated or annoyed because of your craving because of your central desire where the mind is longing and yearning through the ears wanting permanently agreeable sounds when you hear the sound of the music that you don't like, you get frustrated, you get agitated, not realizing that you cannot permanently hear things that are agreeable to you. It's just not possible because you live in an impermanent world. And just like you can't hear things that are permanently agreeable to you, that music being next to you, that's impermanent too. It's only a matter of three minutes or five minutes and this light's going to change and that guy's going to go or that girl's going to go and you're not going to hear the music anymore. But for that three minutes, you can be sitting there being angry and frustrated and agitated based on the music of the person next to you. When your mind can just realize, well, of course they're playing that music because that's what they like. And okay, if they like to play that, wonderful. I'm pleased for them rather than sitting there and being angry and disgruntled about it. Just be like, all right, well, they're enjoying the music. Great. Good for them. And this is impermanent. You're not going to be able to get permanently agreeable sounds coming into your ear, right? It's only a matter of time before you hear something that you disagree with, whether it's a sound like this with music or whether it's somebody that says something to you. 
somebody might say something that you either find agreeable or disagreeable based on their speech and based on what they're saying. So if somebody says something complimentary about you, you might like that sound and you get pleasant feelings. But if somebody says something angry or disgruntled or disrespectful or something like this, you might get frustrated or agitated or annoyed. And remember, you can't control what other people do. These teachings aren't explaining the way the world should be. It's explaining the way the world is. And you're going to sometimes hear things that are disagreeable to you. So if you get rid of your craving, desire, attachment, and you understand this world is impermanent, then when you hear something that you would prefer not to hear, it's just like, all right, well, I prefer not to hear that, but I can maintain my contentedness. You can maintain your joy. And you understand that this thing is impermanent. And then the same thing's happening with the nose. There's certain odors, right? If you're walking down the street and you walk past a flower shop and you smell these flowers coming, this odor coming out of the flower shop, wow, that smells so great. Oh, that's such a great smell. But then you keep on walking and now you smell the fumes of the sewer coming up from the sewer and it's like, ah, maybe now you're repulsed by that odor right? This is the mind having craving, desire, attachment, seeing things as agreeable and disagreeable. And now you either get conditioned, pleasant feelings when you experience agreeable contact through the nose, or you get painful feelings through contact through the nose, certain odors that you find to be disagreeable. If you're walking through the mall and you smell a certain perfume or cologne that somebody's wearing, it's like, oh, wow, that smells really great. But then you might turn the corner and you smell somebody else's perfume or cologne. And it's like, oh, that's horrible. That's the worst smell ever. But what you're going to need to do is maintain your contentedness. Don't allow your mind to be repulsed by this. There's going to be certain things you prefer by the time you get to enlightenment, but you can maintain your contentedness regardless, no matter what you're coming in contact with. Then there's contact through the tongue. There are certain flavors that you find agreeable to you that when that flavor hits your tongue, you might get conditioned pleasant feelings like maybe chocolate cake or chocolate ice cream, right? Or some fruit or some vegetable. You really, really like this. But then when you taste this certain flavor that your mind hasn't experienced before perhaps, or it wasn't what you were expecting, now your mind might be repulsed by that and feeling frustrated or agitated or annoyed. So what you're going to need to do is recognize that these flavors, you're not going to be able to get permanently agreeable flavors through the tongue. And one of the ways you can train yourself is to actually eat foods that you typically don't eat and train the mind that this food is just to sustain the body. It's not to please the mind. When there's sensual desire in the mind, you'll go after foods that you want for pleasing, for pleasant feelings. You'll avoid foods that you don't like. But no matter what you do, as you travel, you're not going to be able to get permanently agreeable food. You're going to sit down in a restaurant or you're going to sit down at a friend's house or you're going to eat some of your own food maybe that you thought is going to taste one way or another. And when you taste it, it's not going to taste the way you like. So if you're repulsed by that and your mind is agitated and frustrated, this is because of the mind's central desire, the craving, desire, attachment. So what you do is you desensitize the mind. You train the mind that you're not going to get what you want all the time. So going to restaurants, going to places and eating foods that your mind typically doesn't eat, this can be really helpful. So for example, if you don't like sour foods and you're repulsed by sour foods, I would encourage you to go buy a couple lemons and a couple limes and start sucking on those and start desensitizing the mind. Or if you don't like a bitter food or something like this, or some people don't like durian, some people really enjoy durian. Some people are repulsed by it. If you guys know what durian is, it's this fruit that smells kind of like poop. You know, some people say no, that it smells like something else, but it's a fruit that smells like poop. And I've never had poop in my mouth, but when I put durian in my mouth, it has the consistency of what I think poop would probably be in your mouth, right? So when I first started eating durian, I was repulsed by it, right? It's like, it smells like poop, it has the consistency of poop when you put it in your mouth, and I was repulsed by it. But over time, through training the mind, I learned to actually enjoy durian and like durian because I started eating it and kind of desensitizing the mind and no longer seeing it that way. Right. And what I had to do is gradually do that. I would eat durian and like cakes because I like cake. I like cookies. Obviously, you can probably tell. Right. As you uh, as I eat cake and cookies, it has a different um consistency. It doesn't have that same consistency, but there's still a little bit of that odor. So I kind of 
incrementally move my mind towards eating durian. And now I can eat durian uh, by itself, no problem, even though that smell is there, even though the consistency is still there. So you're going to need to put the mind in the situation that it doesn't want to be in because your mind is going to want to push these things aside because of aversion. It's going to either push a person away or it's going to push the situation away and thinking that that solves the problem. But it doesn't solve the problem because eventually you're going to get into a situation where you're at a restaurant and the food doesn't taste so great. And if you're sitting there eating that food, you're going to be disgruntled and agitated. Maybe you're frustrated. You feel like you wasted your money because the food doesn't taste so great. But if you can start viewing food as just something to sustain the body, now when you're eating, you can maintain your contentedness. And of course, it doesn't taste the way you would like it to taste, but you can still eat it. And this is really helpful. So rather than throw that thing away or rather than, you know, push it away, go ahead and eat it and train your mind to, to be able to eat that. One of the things I did to train my mind like this is when I was living in America, they had a food plan where I could like order a food service and they delivered food like two or three days a week. And I didn't even pick the food. It was just a set menu and I would just eat whatever was given to me. It's kind of like replicating what the monks do. The monks walk down the street and they just eat whatever food is given to them. So I replicated this for a long time for myself when I was living in America where I had a meal plan and I would just eat whatever was given to me. And then I started doing that even here in Thailand where I would go into restaurants and I would say, um, hey, what do you recommend that I order off the menu to the food server? And the food server would say, oh, I would order this. Okay, I'll take that. Right? Just let somebody else pick your food rather than you selecting your food because you're going to only pick the things that you really want. You're going to sit there and look at the menu potentially and find the exact thing that you want. You can have other people pick your food like a food server. Or in some cases, I used to have my wife pick my food and she would pick my food for a long time. This is a way to desensitize your mind to any choices that it's trying to make and ensure that you're eliminating any sensual desire related to the tongue. Right, Because your, your mind is going to try to push away the things you don't like and only make decisions to eat the things that you like. Right, And you'd like to avoid all of that. You would like to train the mind that, okay, sometimes you're going to get things you enjoy and sometimes you're not. But you can still eat it and not be repulsed by it and not be agitated and not be frustrated. The same thing's happening with the body, certain bodily contact. There are certain fabrics that you find to be um, potentially um, agreeable to you. And there are certain fabrics that you might find disagreeable to you. And when you have these certain fabrics on your body, you feel really great. And when you don't have those things, you might feel not so, not so great. I realized when I came here to Thailand, uh, I brought with me a whole bunch of cotton underwear because in America, that's pretty much what you have is cotton underwear. Where here in Thailand, when I started buying underwear, they didn't really have cotton underwear. They had this like kind of neoprene polyester kind of underwear thing. And I noticed that when I was wearing those underwear, I couldn't fall asleep. I would be laying in bed for like three hours having difficulties falling asleep because the mind was craving, desiring, attached, wanting certain fabrics on the body, wanting certain agreeable contact. So I needed to train the mind to be able to uh, have all these different fabrics because cotton underwear are not permanent, right? So you're going to need to observe your mind and see is there anything that it's wanting to have physical contact with and that finds that agreeable. Let me give you another example. Say you're walking down the street, you're walking on the sidewalk and you're just walking alone. It's like, wow, this is really agreeable to me. I have lots of space to walk down the street, walk down the sidewalk. But now maybe somebody bumps into you, their shoulder bumps you, and maybe now you get agitated or frustrated. Maybe even your ego arises. This is because the mind is wanting permanently agreeable contact. You'll need to understand that you live in a world with other beings. People are going to bump into you from time to time. People are going to step on your foot from time to time. I remember growing up as a kid, if somebody stepped on our foot, that was like fight. All right, it's time to fight. You stepped on my shoes. You can put a mark on my shoes. It's time to fight, right? This is the mind seeing that contact as disagreeable where you're going to need to understand that sometimes you're going to be able to walk down the street and you'll have all the space you need. Other times you're going to walk down the street and people are going to bump into you. That's just the way that it happens due to this body can experience permanently agreeable contact. So if you crave permanently agreeable contact with certain fabrics or only being able to walk down the street by yourself, then when you experience a different fabric or you experience somebody bumping into you, your mind will experience painful feelings like anger, sadness, frustration, or something else. And then there's the mind itself. 
the mind's longing and yearning within the mind itself. There's something called mental objects. Now, when we talk about mental objects, um, we mostly talk about them in terms of unwholesome mental objects. Like all the 10 fetters are mental objects. When you learn the 10 fetters, those are all mental objects. So sensual desire itself is a mental object. But also when we talk about it through the six sense spaces, there's this other aspect of mental objects, like any kind of thought or any kind of thinking or anything like this is a mental object. Even loving kindness and generosity and compassion, these things are mental objects too. We tend to talk about mental objects as unwholesome, but there is also wholesome mental objects. And there's even a way to think about mental objects as certain thoughts or certain thinking. So there's certain thoughts or certain thinking that the mind has. So in the present moment, if you were thinking about something in the past, say you were really rich or really wealthy in the past, and now you don't have very much money in the present moment. In the present moment, your mind can be longing and yearning about things from the past. And now because of those pleasant things that you experienced in the past, you could be experiencing frustration and agitation now because you're no longer rich, you're no longer wealthy. Right. And now in the present moment, you can't maintain your contentedness because of this mental object, because of this thinking or this thought about all the wonderful things you used to do in the past with all that money that you have. And now that you don't have money, you can be discontent. You can be frustrated or agitated. Um, you can also have certain things that you are holding on to, say maybe certain traumatic experiences that you've had in the past. Maybe you've had people that have verbally abused you or physically abused you or sexually abused you in the past. And now in the present moment, you could be experiencing discontentedness based on those things that occurred in the past. Your mind is still clinging to those experiences. That's because of the mental object, right? And now you can have certain things in the future where the mind is longing and yearning towards things in the future. Say that you planned a certain holiday or certain vacation. Now your mind is longing and yearning for that. Maybe you're at work, you've planned this certain plan and six months from now you're going to go to Thailand and visit Thailand. And now you get so excited about going to Thailand. This is because of that mental object, that thinking, that thought about something in the future. But now when you show up to the airport and your flight's delayed or your flight's canceled, you'll be frustrated, you'll be agitated because of what the mind is experiencing. So if you allow the mind to cling to any of these mental objects or thoughts or certain thinking, then you can set yourself up for discontentedness about things from the past or things in the future. So you're going to need to understand what the mind is experiencing is this cravings, desires, attachments. And now because of its central desire, this craving, desire, attachments in the mind, it's longing and yearning through these six sense spaces, wanting permanently agreeable contact wanting permanently agreeable contact. And when it gets what it wants, it gets those conditioned pleasant feelings. And when it doesn't get what it wants, it gets those painful feelings, right? So it's going to get those pleasant feelings of happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria, or it's going to get those painful feelings of sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety. And it's all because contact is entering into these six sense spaces. And now based on the mind's cravings, desires, attachments, its wants, its expectations, it's going to see that contact is either agreeable or disagreeable. And if it's agreeable contact, you'll get pleasant feelings. If it's disagreeable contact, you'll get painful feelings. By the time you get to enlightenment and by the time you've eliminated this sensual desire, you'll no longer have agreeable or disagreeable contact. It's just contact. It's just a sound. It's not agreeable to me or it's not disagreeable. It's just a flavor. It's not agreeable or disagreeable. It's just a flavor. It's just a certain... A uh, form that you see, a certain sound, a certain odor, a certain flavor, a certain physical object, certain mental objects, not agreeable or disagreeable. But when you have craving or desire attachment in your mind, you're going to see it as agreeable or disagreeable. But by you practicing breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity, those are the consistent ongoing trainings that you're doing to knock down your cravings, desires, attachments. And then with your mindfulness and awareness of mind, where you see the arising of discontentedness, you apply right effort to cut that off and let it go. You restrain the mind more and more. You eliminate your cravings, desires, attachments, and it's no longer agreeable or disagreeable contact anymore. It's just contact and your mind can maintain its peacefulness. It can maintain its joy. But in the process of getting there, you're going to experience this agreeable and disagreeable contact. 
Any questions on the six cent spaces? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, David. So I'm now really curious as to where joy resides. So is joy in the absence of the discontentedness or the acceptance of this? You could look at it as the, the unconditioned joy is the absence of discontentedness. You could look at it that way. The joy is the unconditioned joy where you're just joyful. When you have cravings, desires, attachments in your mind, you can only be happy when you get what you want. Mm -hmm. And when you don't get what you want, you can't be happy. By the time you get to the joy, the unconditioned joy, the cravings, desires, attachments are gone. It's just contact. It's, it's just the dog barking. It's just the dog barking. It's, it's just not, present moment. It's yeah. just really present moment. It's not moment. good. It's not bad. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just contact. It's just the sun. And no, that's the rain. You know, it's just impermanence. That's all it is. Okay. That you don't crave things to be any particular way. Okay. You make wise decisions to... Mm -hmm produce a, uh, experiences that would be helpful for you. But along the way, you realize that you're going to meet with impermanence. And as long as you're not clinging to your decisions, you can just go with the flow. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's very simple. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, what happens in the instant that the uh, senses that you are experienced are due to an ill or a sickness. For instance, um, I don't know, uh, some fabrics, I cannot use them because mm -hmm. they make this body ill. Mm -hmm. So obviously I um, develop a, um, an aversion of the fabric or the food or something else. Mm -hmm. So um, how can I work this out or how this is function? If there is something that you more than you dislike or like is something due to a illness or a sickness. Sure. So part of what you're doing on this journey to enlightenment is you're working to understand this being who you are now, this body and this mind, trying to figure out what makes this mind tick, what makes this mind uh, experience wonderful things in the world, and, and what does this body need to sustain its life. And if you've discovered that this body is uh, allergic to certain fabrics or certain foods, then it's wise decision making not to eat those things or not to come in contact with those types of fabrics. So if you've come to that conclusion that you realize that this body is allergic to any particular fabric, then you just know as a wise decision that I'm not going to come in contact with that fabric. But let's just say you do come in contact with that fabric without you realizing it. And now you have the allergic reaction. Okay, I have this allergic reaction. Let me just take care of it. Let me get the medicine. Let me go to the hospital if that's what I need to do. Let me see the doctor. This allergic reaction is impermanent. I just need to make some wise decisions to fix it. Being agitated or annoyed or frustrated, that's not going to fix anything. So it's wise to make decisions based on what you know about this body if it has any allergies, but then come to understand that you may come in contact with those things at some point. And when it, when the mind or the body does come in contact with these things, just maintain your contentedness and make wise decisions to get over that because you know, it's impermanent, that allergic reaction. <coughs> okay. Any questions? All right. All right. So let's go on here. This is why you need to learn the six sense bases because it helps you to understand that discontentedness enters into the mind so that you can practice right mindfulness. You can be aware through your mind. You can actually guard the doorways to discontentedness and protect your own contentedness. I'll give you an example on this. I, um, <clears throat> at one time I realized that when I drink coffee, the mind was getting really excited and kind of in this kind of a uh, heightened state of excitement and I had difficulty sleeping and I would get headaches and I realized that it was unwise for me to drink coffee and, and ingest caffeine. So I decided to distance myself from coffee. I stopped going to coffee shops. I stopped being around coffee for a period of time. Well, then one day I was walking down the street and I turned the corner and I got this big whiff of coffee and 
boom, I was in the coffee shop standing in line getting my coffee, even though I knew I was going to have a three day headache by getting this coffee. But I had such a craving for it. I was standing in that line. I really wanted the coffee. And I was telling myself the whole time, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is so silly. You're so stupid. You're going to you're going to have a headache for three days. Why are you drinking this coffee? But even though I got up to the line, I was like, okay, iced coffee, please. You know, and I ordered the coffee and I sat down and I started drinking it. Eventually I threw it away and that was the last coffee I ever drank. But then after I, I did that, it took me a while to get to that point. But after I did that, I had to reflect. I was like, what was it that allowed that craving to arise? What was it that got me? Something pulled me. Oh, it was the odor. It was the odor. Okay, that's what it was. My mind's not strong enough yet to experience the odor of coffee. I could distance myself from it. I was choosing not to be around it, but the odor pulled me back in. So once I realized that, I then started making different decisions. When I would see coffee shops, I would go to the other side of the street and I would switch to the other side of the street and I'd walk down that side of the street. And I had to do this for a period of time, for a few months, until I eliminated my craving, desire, attachment for coffee. And now I can go into coffee shops. Sometimes students like to have a one-on-one a -on -one talk and they invite me to a coffee shop. I just get a bottle of water or a smoothie or something else like this and we sit down in the coffee shop, no big deal. Um, but for that period of time where my mind was somewhat sensitive and that craving was still there, I realized that I needed to guard the, the, the nose. I needed to guard that sense base that whenever I walked past an area where there was a smell of coffee, I needed to move to the other side of the street. Or if I couldn't do that, I would walk in the opposite direction because I wasn't interested in allowing this craving to arise. So if you can understand that these six sense spaces are the doorways to your discontentedness, Anytime you, you experience discontentedness, you can track it to a specific sense space. You can think right now, if you would like to take a moment to reflect, think about a recent time where you've been angry or frustrated or irritated, or even you got pleasant feelings, so excited. Think about that experience. What was the one or two or three sense spaces that you received contact through? Was it the eyes? that you saw something agreeable or disagreeable and you got either pleasant feelings or painful feelings? Was it the ears? Did you hear a certain sound that was either agreeable or disagreeable to you? Was it an odor that you saw either agreeable or disagreeable? Was it a certain flavor? Was it certain contact with a physical object to the body? Or was it a mental object, certain thoughts or certain thinking that you were having? You can trace every single situation of discontentedness to either one or more of your sense bases. And if you can start doing that, if you can start delineating all the way down to that level, you can start making really wise decisions. I'll give you another example. I, at one time, I used to sleep with the fan on in my room. I used to have a fan that circulates the air. And I wasn't, <clears throat> I wasn't sure <clears throat> whether my mind was attached to the sound or not, that maybe I was falling asleep when I heard this sound. And maybe if I didn't have this sound anymore, maybe I wouldn't have, maybe I wouldn't be able to fall asleep. So for many months, I was falling asleep with the sound of the fan. And I decided to start turning off the fan in order to see if the mind could still fall asleep. And in that situation, I was able to fall asleep without the fan, but these are the things that you're going to need to test. You're going to need to test these things because when we talk about the focus and the concentration and the clarity of mind and the deep memory of the enlightened mind, where this is coming from is that you're eliminating your cravings, desires, attachments. It's not the meditation itself that is producing the concentration and the focus and the clarity. You are exercising the mind there. That's not what's actually providing and producing the heightened qualities of mind in the enlightened mental state. It's not the tools and the techniques that the Buddha is teaching you. Those tools and techniques are there to eradicate the pollutions out of your mind. It's eradicating the pollutions out of your mind that's producing these improved qualities of mind. So you're going to need to eliminate your cravings, desires, attachments. And as you are, this is where you're going to see the improved qualities of mind. So you're going to need to look at how you experience life 
And then if you see things that you're doing repetitively over and over and over again, you're going to need to introduce some impermanence and train the mind to not do these things. So if you wear the same jewelry every day, if you wear a watch outside every day, I would encourage you to leave it at home for a while. Like some days wear it, some days don't wear it. If you have a certain pair of shoes that you wear all the time, some days wear those, some days wear different shoes. If you have um, certain foods that you eat all the time, or if you have a certain place that you sleep all the time, or like I shared with you guys the other day about sitting in a classroom. Sometimes when you come to a classroom, you sit in the same exact spot every single time you show up to a classroom. You'd like to switch this up, train the mind that, hey, you're not going to get what you want all the time. You're going to need to experience this impermanence. So rather than allowing the mind to continue to make these decisions where it's craving permanence, switch things up in your life so that the mind doesn't get able, doesn't have the ability to hold on where it clings and craves. So you're going to need to be aware of these six sense bases so that you can introduce impermanence and kind of mix things up. But then when you know what your cravings, desires, attachments are, you can use these six sense bases to guard the mind. The Buddha talks about this quite a bit in his teachings about guarding your mind with mindfulness. So wherever you see the mind longing and yearning through these sense bases, you can restrain it and you can pull it back. Here, I'll give you another example. Um, You know, you might be in the mall where you see an attractive male or attractive female, somebody that you're really attracted to. Maybe you're walking behind them in the mall and you see with your eyes like, wow, look at their neck, look at their back, look at their legs, look at their butt, look at their this, look at their that, right? And you're walking behind them and you see your mind longing and yearning and you realize that that's a craving. Maybe what you decide to do is rather than allow the mind to long through these eyes, because that's what it's doing, it's longing through the eyes, maybe you duck off into a store to cut that off and let it go. Duck off into a store or look down to the ground or switch to another uh, walkway in the mall. Rather than just sit there and keep gawking at this person obsessively, you might need to redirect the mind towards ducking into a store for a minute or two or three, let that person walk, and then you come out of the mall, you come out of the store back into the mall, right? This is a way to cut off and let go of anything that the mind's craving. Because if you keep letting it sit there and crave and gawk at that person, not only are you going to, this central desire is going to long and yearn through your eyes, but you're going to experience the same thing through the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. So anytime you see the mind longing and yearning, you would like to cut it off and cut it off. So it's your mindfulness or awareness of mind that's going to make you aware of that longing and yearning, but then you're going to need to apply right effort to cut it off and redirect the mind and take it in a different direction. <clears throat> this helps you to understand the fetter of central desire. The understanding the six sense bases, you can see very clearly what the mind's doing. And hopefully I've shared enough examples with you and I've given you an opportunity to reflect that you can see that your mind is indeed doing this, that it indeed has this central desire and it's longing and yearning through these sense bases. And this is helping you to understand the underlying problem that's in the mind and why you need to eliminate that central desire. You can get to the point where you eliminate certain cravings, desires, attachments, and This is the cause of discontentedness, but then there are certain things that you'll be able to actually continue to enjoy. Like I gave you the example of the chocolate cake the other day. Like if your mind is having craving, desire, attachment to eat chocolate cake, and when you go to this restaurant, you get pleasant feelings based on eating this chocolate cake, well, you're going to need to distance yourself from that for a period of time because If you allow the mind to continue to crave and long and yearn for this chocolate cake, when you show up to the restaurant and they don't have your chocolate cake, you'll be irritated and frustrated. So you're going to need to distance yourself and choose not to eat that chocolate cake for a period of time, maybe three months, six months, whatever it ends up being. But then when you realize that the mind has eliminated its craving, desire, attachment, You can eat chocolate cake. There's no harm in eating chocolate cake, but you're going to need to learn how to do that without allowing the mind to get conditioned pleasant feelings so that then you don't get the conditioned painful feelings, right? So if there's destructive cravings, if there's unwholesome cravings, you're going to need to eliminate those and just never go back to them. But there are certain things like chocolate cake or other things like this, or maybe like a car or a mobile phone or a computer. It's not the object itself that is the craving. It's inside the mind. The sensual desire is inside the mind. The six sense bases is just a doorway that's allowing the contact to come in through the mind. So you're going to need to protect these doorways 
understanding the central desire will help you to be able to protect your contentedness so that when you see the mind longing and yearning through these doorways, you can cut it off and let it go and redirect the mind. Okay. So let's talk now about central desire. Central desire is the mind longing and yearning through these sense spaces. There's this longing and yearning through the eyes to see certain agreeable forms, through the ears to hear certain agreeable sounds, through the nose to smell agreeable odors. There's this longing and yearning, this chasing, this wanting agreeable contact. And then the same thing is occurring through the tongue to taste certain flavors and then through the body to touch certain physical objects and through the mind to recognize certain mental objects. And then it's repulsed by the disagreeable. And this is what you're training the mind to uh, revert, to essentially rewire the mind so it doesn't continue to stay conditioned in this way. Okay. Here's a little diagram that I made. I sometimes think diagrams help you to be able to understand what's going on. So there's this mind that has the central desire. And then there's the craving or the longing, the yearning through the body. The body is the mechanism that's bringing in contact through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, uh, the body, and then the mind itself. It's longing for forms, sounds, odors, flavors, physical objects, and then certain mental objects. This is what the mind's longing and yearning. It's using those six sense bases as doorways to bring in contact. Okay, so this is kind of a diagram to help you. My son picked out the Bentley. I think that's what that is. He picked out a Bentley. I was like, what is something that you long and yearn through through the eyes? You know, like a car. So I put that one in there. Okay. Oops. All right, so now we're gonna sh- I'm going to share something with you. This is from the Buddha. He talks about... In order to get to the first stage of enlightenment, you're going to need to know the cause, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape. This is something that you need to know. And now that you've learned enough about all the various teachings, you can learn this. So the cause of this discontentedness is craving desire attachment. The disappearance of this discontentedness, that it arises, it changes, and it fades away, this is the universal truth of impermanence. The gratification that the mind wants and that it's longing for, the unenlightened mind's fetter of central desire. That's the mind trying to gratify itself. It's trying to get these pleasant feelings. The danger in all of this is that the mind's going to experience this discontentedness, that it can't maintain its contentedness. The mind's going to go up and down and up and down, up and down. That's the danger. Then the escape from all of this is the Eightfold Path. That's the restraining of the mind. That it's the Eightfold Path that's giving you the perfect plan to be able to dial in each one of those factors and learn how to restrain the mind. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is the training that you need to be able to eliminate your cravings, desires, attachments. So this is the cause, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape. The escape is the Eightfold Path. That's what's going to help you escape all of this. I see a bunch of you guys writing this down. I was going to switch, but I'll give you guys some time to, to write this down. I see some of you guys moving. Is it too cold in here? Yeah. yeah. There's remote controls up there that you guys can adjust the temperature on that top shelf on the right. You guys can turn the fans on and off. You can turn the air conditioning on and off. I've got this one blowing down on me, um, so I can feel okay. But you guys adjust it for whatever you guys would like. Any questions on anything here? Yes, ma'am. Does this teaching have a specific name? This one here, um, it doesn't have a specific name, like the five precepts or things like that. We just call it the cause, disappearance, gratification, danger, and escape. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. By the way, all these slides that I'm using, you can actually get them in a PDF document online. If you go to our website, 
Um, if you click on free books all the way at the bottom, there's a place where it says resources and you'll see the slides even with a white background so you can print it out. And there's even a workbook that has the slides and then it has a place for you to take notes. There's a print shop down the street, just only about 50 meters that you could take those. Uh, you could go to that shop. You could pull this PDF document up on their computer from our website and you could print it out if you like. So you're welcome to take notes and stuff like that. But if you'd like any of these stuff, uh, you can get it for free through uh, getting a print if you like a print or just download it to your device if you'd like it. Okay. All right. So now that you guys understand all of this, now I'm going to teach you what you need to do on a, on a day to by day, moment by moment basis in order to eliminate your cravings, desires, attachments. I call this identifying your cravings, cultivating non-craving and analysis of the mind. That discontentedness that you experience, whether it's a pleasant feeling, painful feeling, or neither painful nor pleasant, the happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria, the anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, the loneliness, the boredom, the shyness, the resentment, the jealousy, all of these discontent feelings, this is like a red light on the dashboard of your car. It's alerting you that, hey, there's something wrong here. And if you had the red light on the dashboard of your car come up, what would you do? Would you keep driving the car or would you pull over and perhaps start looking about what's wrong with this car? You'd probably pull over, right? And if you have a little bit of skills, you'd probably pop the hood and you start looking under the hood and see if you can figure out what's going on with this car. But if you don't have the skills, you'd probably take this car to a mechanic and ask the mechanic to take a look at your car and figure out what's going on. So these discontent feelings are the same thing. They're the red light on the dashboard of your car. They're alerting you, hey, something's wrong here. You've got some issue here with your car. There's something wrong with the mind here. There's an issue. You've got some sadness. You've got some guilt. You've got some shame. This is the red light showing you, hey, you've got a craving, desire, attachment here. You're going to need to identify it. Just like you build the ability and the skill to meditate, you're going to need to develop the skill and ability to identify your own cravings and to understand what is it that the mind's longing and yearning for. And if you have some skills and abilities, you can figure that out on your own. But where you don't, you need to take your car to the mechanic. The mechanic is your teacher. You need to bring your mind to the teacher and you schedule an appointment with me or you send me a private message or you ask a question in class. We have four different ways you can get help. You can post a question in our Facebook group and I'm the only one that will answer it. You can send me a private message. You can schedule personal guidance or you can ask questions in classes like this. Right? These are the four ways that you can get help. So you bring your mind to the mechanic and you say, hey, teacher, I've got this guilt or I've got this shame or I've got this stress or I've got this anxiety. I've got this sadness. I've got this frustration. And I don't know what the cravings, desires, attachments are. I can start asking you questions and kind of walking you through and you'll be able to then discover what your cravings, desires, attachments are. That's one way to do it. In some cases, a student has looked inward. They've done that inward reflection, that introspection, and they come to me and they say, hey, teacher, I have this uh, you know, sadness that I'm experiencing. Here's the various cravings that I think that this might be. And I would like to just talk to you to confirm that it sounds like I'm on the right track. Right. You can do that, too. So you could come to me and say, I have no idea what's causing it. Can you help me figure it out? Or you can say, hey, this is what I think might be causing it. Is this what you think? Am I on the right track? And once again, I'll just ask you some questions, try to understand and uncover what's going on in your mind. And then you might realize and confirm that, yes, the cravings, desires, attachments that you were thinking are indeed the cravings, desires, attachments that are in the mind. But you also might uncover some other ones as well. When you do this two, three, four times, eventually you'll get to the point where you've developed this skill and you won't need to come to me you know, every single time. It'll just probably be two, three, four, five, six times. But even students who have studied with me for six months or a year, even two years sometimes, they come to me and they say, hey, David, this thing happened the other day and I have no idea how, what my mind's craving. Like one time a student came to me and said, hey, David, I left work uh, this morning and I came back and I got so frustrated. My wife had her craft project all over the house and I walked in and I got so frustrated. I don't understand why. Maybe you guys can see this. What's happening here? Do you see it? Do you see what's happened? What's that? They're craving permanence, right? What sense base is involved? 
Right. They came back and they saw that the house wasn't exactly the way it was when they left. And when they came back, their wife had this craft project all over the house. The house looked different than it did when they were there previously. And their mind was craving for the house to look one particular way. And when they came back and it looked different through the eyes, they saw something that was disagreeable to them, which was this craft project all over the house. Right. So you might need this. This person had no idea what their craving was. So I just helped them to be able to see that, that their mind was craving and longing, yearning through the eyes for permanently agreeable contact. And what was agreeable to them was everything had to be in a certain spot. And if everything was in that certain spot, they would be happy. But if things were out of place, they would be sad or angry or frustrated. And it's not possible for this house to look one way permanently. It's just not possible. The house is going to look different ways at different times. And just like your wife has this project all over the house, that's not permanent either. Eventually she's going to put it away, right? And you can maybe even help her, right? So you're going to need to be able to see these kinds of things. So use that discontentedness. In this example, the frustration was the red light. And they knew that there was something wrong. And they knew that there was a craving. But they needed to take their mind to the mechanic. And they came and talked with me. And I helped them with that. So once you realize that you have this red light that's come up, you're going to need to go through this process. That when discontentedness occurs in the present moment, cut it off and let it go. Don't start to try to analyze it yet. Don't try to be introspective yet because the craving has arised. The discontentedness has come up in the mind. There's this agitation, this annoyance, this frustration in the mind. That's not the time to start being introspective. You would like to just cut it off and cut it off and cut it off. The mind's creating this conditioned feeling and you're trying to break that up, not allow the mind to get that conditioned feeling. And now later, once the mind has eliminated its discontent feeling, whether it's pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, eliminating that as a bodily sensation, that would be ideal to cut it off there. But if it becomes a feeling, cut it off there. Or if it's a condition of the mind, cut it off there, right? But then once you eliminate that and the mind's calm, that might be a few minutes, a few hours, a few days. Now you can start being introspective. This is step number two. Start reflecting on what was the cravings, desires, attachments that led to this. What was it in your mind that led to this discontentedness? Because what the mind's going to want to do is blame other people. It's going to want to look around and find somebody else. Somebody else is causing this anger. Somebody else is causing this frustration. If you keep doing that, you'll never solve your problem. But if you can start being introspective and you can start being reflective and look inward, you can solve your problem because you're looking at the real problem. As long as you blame other people and you push other people away, you're not actually going to solve the real problem because that's not the problem. So once you cut off and let go, which is step one, then step two, start being reflective and start looking inward, start being introspective. What was your mind longing and yearning through? Was it the eyes? Was it the ears? Was it the nose? Was it the tongue? Was it the body? Was it the mind itself? What was the cravings, desires, attachments? You can identify a particular sense base and you can then identify the actual craving itself. Then once you identify what the cravings are, then the step number three is you develop a plan to eliminate the specific craving, desire, attachment that caused the discontentedness so that you can then develop the ability to let go. You're going to need to have breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity ongoing as a consistent ongoing practice to train the mind to let go. But then you're going to need to put the mind in specific situations where it's having a craving desire attachment to train it to let go. I'll give you an example. One time I left my house and I was about five minutes down the road and I went to grab my cell phone and I realized I didn't have my cell phone. And I noticed this fear come up into the mind. And right away, I started getting all this fear. Well, the first thing I did is I cut it off. I cut it off. I let it go. I was like, all right, cut that fear off. Then I started being introspective. What is it that the mind's craving? What is it that it's longing for? Ah, it's longing for the phone. Through the eyes, it's wanting the phone to be permanent. And this phone is not permanent, right? So now when I realized that the mind was longing and yearning for the phone, the first thing that the mind wanted to do was turn around and go get the phone. It thought that that was going to solve the problem. That's what the mind wanted to do. But in that moment of introspection and looking inward, I realized that going to get the phone isn't going to solve the problem because the craving is going to still persist. It's just satisfying the mind, right? So as long as I turned around and went and got the phone, 
it didn't give the mind the opportunity to eliminate its craving, desire, attachment. So what I needed to do was distance myself from the phone. So instead of turning around to go get the phone, I decided to go out and continue to go through my day. I was only planning to be out for an hour and a half that day. I just had a couple of things I needed to do. But instead, I elongated my time outside. I went to the movies. I got some popcorn. I went to dinner. I stayed out for like five, six hours without the phone. I had to teach the mind, you can be outside without the phone. It's okay. You don't need to have fear. You can be peaceful. You can be joyful. If you need to call somebody, I'm sure somebody would let you borrow their phone if you have an emergency. And then I started reminding myself, when you were a kid, there was no such thing as mobile phones. You used to go out all the time without a mobile phone when you were a child, but my mind had gotten attached to the phone, right? So I went outside without the phone. That was the plan that I executed. Then about every two or three days, I intentionally left the phone at home to try to train the mind to go out into the world without the phone. And I would still notice some agitation in those subsequent times going out, but it kept getting lesser and lesser and lesser and lesser. So after like two, three, four times of going outside without the phone, I realized that there was no fear, there was no agitation, there was no agi- irritation or anything. So I was like, okay, I think I've gotten rid of this craving. So now it's just a wise choice to take the phone out when you go in case you need to contact somebody or you need a map or you need something online. It's a wise choice to maybe have a phone. Well, then about two months after that, I left the house again and I realized that I left my phone at home. I was like, oh, my phone's not there. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I just kept on going. No fear, no agitation, no nothing. So I knew in that moment that I had eliminated the craving, desire, attachment to the phone. Because prior to that, there was fear that arose in the mind. And then there was agitation in those subsequent times that I went out into the world without the phone. So this is a process or a methodology or a best practice that you could be using on a continuous ongoing basis that once you work through all these steps, you then repeat this for the next incident of discontentedness. So anytime your mind's discontent, cut it off and let it go in the moment. You don't even have to think twice about it. That's why in meditation, you're just cutting off and cutting off and cutting off and cutting off to give your mind the ability to easily cut off in the present moment in daily life. And that's also why you're practicing generosity to be able to train the mind to easily let go. And you would like to practice these things on a daily basis, meditation and generosity. Then once your mind has let go, like I let go of that fear, Then I sat there and I was introspective and I started thinking about this. What is the mind really craving? Ah, it's craving for this phone to be permanent. Well, what's the wise choice? Is it to go get the phone or is it to keep going? Well, if you're looking to get rid of craving, desire, attachment, keep going, right? Leave the phone at home. And then I subsequently put the mind in that situation over repetitive sessions until eventually I realized that the mind had eliminated its craving, desire, attachment. And then there was the opportunity where I inadvertently left the phone at home two months later and it confirmed for me, yes, I had eliminated this craving, desire, attachment. So you're going to need to repeat this in multiple situations with various cravings, desires, attachments. This is a methodology that you can use over and over and over and over and over again. And in a situation like a phone, you know, you can start using it again. But if it's something else, you know, that's unwholesome or unwise, you're going to need to just eliminate it from your life 100% and just never go back to it. Any questions on this? (coughs) Yes, ma'am. So I don't always catch it. (laughs) So um, (coughs) let's say I have a reaction out of all of this. Mm -hmm. Do I then just stop having reacted and then repeat this? Or is there another step? Once you do this, along with your breathing, mindfulness, meditation, Mm -hmm. and generosity, you eliminate your attachment. And then it won't arise any longer because it'll be completely gone. Right, but let's say which happens for me a lot. I know this, but I, I don't always in the present moment. Oh, I see. So I will actually have a reaction. I see. And then, so I guess that's what I'm curious about. Do I recognize I've had that reaction, hopefully mm. not done, done any harm, may have done some harm? Yep. Through my, my why and why speech, let's say. Yep. 
So in that moment, what do I do? So like you've been unskillful in your intentions, your right. speech, your actions. Right. What I would encourage you to do is if you need to apologize, apologize. Let the person know that you're sorry, that you're working to do better, um, realizing that you're a work in progress, right? That you're not going to be able to do this perfectly from the get-go, right? So apologize. That helps you to clean up your karma, your unwholesome karma that you've created. So apologize to the person and then reflect on what was your cravings, desires, attachments, and how do I now eliminate that? And if you need help, that's where you can reach out to me and let me know like, hey, this is a situation that occurred. I'm not quite sure what to do next. And then I can walk you through it. Once you do this a few times, you'll become an expert at it and you'll be able to do it readily. But you're probably going to need to apologize in some situations because your mind, if you haven't developed enough meditation and you haven't developed enough generosity, you're not going to be able to cut off as a bodily sensation yet. It is going to become a feeling. And then that feeling is going to motivate unskillful conduct. And that's what you're trying to revert. You're trying to revert the mind from not getting that conditioned feeling so it doesn't go all the way to a, a unskillful conduct. So one of the things that I share with people is when you start learning this, eventually when you start, when you are able to restrain the unskillful conduct, you're going to find that you're going to go through a period of time where you're kind of quietly frustrated, where in the past you would have been frustrated and agitated, and then you became unskillful in your attention, speech, and actions, and you now damaged your relationships. What you'll eventually do is you'll be able to throttle that back where you're not being unskillful in your attention, speech, and actions anymore, but you're quietly frustrated. And then that goes on for a period of time and you're cutting that off and cutting it off and cutting it off. And then eventually you get to the point where you start observing the bodily sensations more and then you're cutting it off there. So it's really like, it's like a wild bush. The mind has this root of craving, desire, attachment, and it's grown this wild bush. And now you're cutting it back and 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 cutting it back. Eventually you uproot it out of the mind and it won't arise any longer. So if you need to apologize, apologize, calm down, and then figure out what were your cravings, desires, attachments. And if you need to calm down first before you apologize, that can oftentimes be more wise because you'll be more sincere in your apology. But as you're apologizing, um, I don't suggest that you say, like, I'll never do that again, right? Because you don't necessarily know that, right? And then if you do it again, then they're going to be hurt even more, perhaps. So um, apologizing is a great way to clean up some karma, and, and that can go a long way. All right, we have a question here on Zoom. I can't read it because it's kind of small. And I have trouble with my eyes. Let's see. This is Joshua. Is Joshua still here with us online? Yeah, Joshua's still here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Joshua's asking, hey, David, I am curious as I have come down with a stomach illness while traveling. I have learned that when my gut health is bad, my mental health is also very discontent. So I'm curious where does gut health fall under the sense object or is this something separate nope this falls under the same thing because all discontentedness is going to come through the six sense bases so this is the mind being attached to the physical form of the body those five aggregates i'm not sure if you were around when i was talking about the five aggregates those five aggregates the mind's clinging to this body craving it to be permanently healthy so the body in the mind there's that longing and yearning through the mind for this body to be permanently healthy and this body can't be permanently healthy like you hear me i don't know if you've been in classes with me before i usually don't talk this way right my nose is all clogged up my throat's a little bit sore starting to get congestion in the in the lungs but this is impermanence. It's not going to be permanent. This body cannot be permanently healthy. So you can learn how to maintain your contentedness, maintain your peacefulness and joy, even when the body is unhealthy. So right now, if you're experiencing discontentedness, when you are having this impermanence with the body, you need to train your mind that this body can't be permanently healthy. And in terms of this plan, like this plan that I'm teaching you right here, in a lot of cases, you can do what I'm describing right here. But in terms of the body's unhealthiness, I wouldn't encourage you to put the body in a situation where it is unhealthy and then train your mind to 
accept that and understand that impermanence. But this is going to happen by itself. You're not going to have to do anything for this body to now experience this impermanence. But with the phone, I had to create some impermanence so that the mind could deal with that. So each time the body gets unhealthy, you're going to just need to train the mind that, okay, permanent health is not possible. But also this sickness is not permanent either. You'll eventually get back to health and then just make some wise decisions to get back to health as soon as possible, realizing that that's going to be um, taking some time, that it's not going to be instantaneous. So this is still the six sense spaces where the mind is longing and yearning, wanting this body to be permanently healthy. Any other questions you guys have? Yes, ma'am. There's some more mics too, if you would like to get a mic. No, you can get one here if you like, because that, that way the people online, we can keep going in our class. Yes, ma'am. Um, is there um, some things that are more difficult to, I don't know, to control or to get the discontentedness? For instance, the things that are uh, through the nose, through the ears, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> uh, the example that you gave with the cell phone, it's more easy that uh, some things that are happening in the mind, because uh, the mind I know sometimes is crazy and has a lot of um, <coughs> uh, unhealthy, um, unhealthy, how do you say, um, like thinking. And I don't know if, it's, if it's, this is more difficult. Uh, than the ones that with the with the senses like the ears or the the eyes, etc. I don't know if I make sense. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, everybody's a little bit different. It depends what cravings, desires, attachments you have in your mind. You're going to find certain things more difficult and more challenging than somebody else might, right? And this is where it's unwise to measure and compare yourself to other people. This is why there's no judgment in the teachings of the Buddha. You shouldn't ever measure and compare yourself because the cravings that you struggle with are going to be different than somebody else. If somebody else can find certain things really easy. Other things people can find very hard. So it depends on what cravings you have in your mind and how deeply held they are. Oftentimes early in practice, there's actually multiple cravings that are occurring that lead to any one particular bout of discontentedness or any one particular situation of discontentedness. So while we talk about it as craving, desire, attachment, you can actually have two, three, four, five, six different cravings that are producing any one uh, situation of discontentedness. Typically, the more intense the feelings are, the more cravings, desires, attachments that are involved and the more deeply held they are. So. Uh, let's give an example. Say, uh, say you get sick. Um, there can be craving, desire, attachment to this body, but there can also be craving, desire, attachment to the activities that you do on a daily basis that you go outside and now you can't do that anymore or certain friends that you were going to see that day. Um, you could be attached to them or the money that you're now going to need to spend to go to the doctor and spend for the doctor. So you could get really angry potentially if you get sick and there's an attachment to the body, there's attachment to the money, there's attachment to the activities, attachment to the friends. And these four or five different attachments are producing this real intense anger and frustration in the mind that now you're sick. Um, so when you're looking inward at these cravings, desires, attachments, it's not going to typically be just one when you're first getting started. There can be three, four, five, six of them, but slowly but surely you can peel those away and eventually you'll get down to less and less cravings. And that's where you'll see going into those jhanas that I talked about last night and getting into this first stage of enlightenment. That's why your discontentedness is diminished by the time you get to the jhanas in the first stage of enlightenment because you've throttled back and eliminated certain cravings in the mind. And there's not as many there anymore. So they're not producing as intense of feelings any longer. There's still discontentedness there, but they're not as intense as it was when you were off the path to enlightenment. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks. Could you speak a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, to generosity and how it helps in this situation? Maybe give an example that we could utilize to improve this. Sure. So generosity is the giving and sharing of more than is strictly required in any given situation without any expectation of anything in return, such as your time, your effort, your energy, or your resources. 
When there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind, the mind tends to be selfish and tends to hold on a lot. It's not willing to give and share. Um, and if you're giving and sharing with an expectation of something back, there's still craving there. So the mind isn't yet practicing pure generosity. So you need to get to the point where you're giving without any expectation of anything in return. So let's say, for example, you observe that you go through your closet to put on a pair, to put on a shirt in the morning and it's been teared or it's been ripped when it was washed and you get really angry or frustrated about your clothes being ripped. And now you see, ah, my mind's clinging to my clothes. I'm frustrated. I'm craving for these clothes to be permanent. Well, you know what? I'm going to bring in some generosity here. I'm going to give away some of my clothes to somebody that, that can use them. Maybe even your favorite clothes that you wear frequently and you like them a whole lot. You're going to give them away. And now this trains your mind to let go of your craving, desire, attachment. Because you can always buy other clothes if you need to. But this is training the mind to let go. Right. Or say that you realize that you're attached to money and you realize this is a common one that the mind's attached to money. Now you might decide to go around and, and give out some money. Like if you spend time here in Thailand, you'll see there's a lot of donation boxes everywhere you go. There's donation boxes. And what you'll notice with generosity is the more frequently that you give, the more impactful it is. So if it's a matter of giving like one big gift a month or one big gift a year, or if you gave like individual smaller gifts each single day or each week or something like this. This is actually more helpful to the mind to train it, to let go of its cravings, desires, attachments. So if you're going about in Thailand, if you go to Lotus, you go to 7-Eleven, you go to different restaurants and stuff, there's usually lots of different places to, to give donations. Just give 10 baht, just give 20 baht, just give 50 baht. And doing that repetitively over the course of your day and your week and your month, this will train your mind to let go of money, to not see things as always needing to be self-satisfying, that those cravings, desires, attachments, the central desire it's selfishness. It's the mind holding on, wanting things to be self-pleasing all the time, where what the mind needs to do to get to enlightenment is recognize this interconnectivity between all beings and realize that I can do things in the world that are going to benefit me. Yes, I need to do that in order to sustain this life, but I can also do things in this world that benefit other people. We spent a whole afternoon yesterday doing things to benefit other people, right? Like we gave all those things. That's why we went to the store. We bought things. We spent all that time rather than just showing up to the orphanage and giving a bunch of money. We spent a whole day, you know, collecting products, collecting things, loading them in the truck, unloading them, doing all these different things. So the more that you put around that, it's going to help you. So where you see your mind having these cravings, desires, attachments, you can be practicing generosity in general throughout your day, but then where you see specific cravings, desires, attachments, you can choose to practice generosity with that. So I'll give you an example too with the phone. Like say you notice you're attached to your phone. You can do the thing like I described, but also you can let other people use your phone, right? And this will help you. Or if you notice that you're attached to your computer and you're just always holding onto your computer, let other people use your computer or you notice that you're holding on to food and you just like my food, my food, my food. Well, offer other people some food. When you sit down at a table and you're eating some food, offer it to other people. This will help you to train your mind to let go. And while we're talking about generosity, it's important to practice this from the middle way too. If you had craving, desire, attachment where you're practicing generosity in excess, you're not going to have the basic necessities that you need to sustain your life. But also, if you never practice generosity, you're going to be quite selfish and holding on to things. So you need to find that middle way where you can practice generosity, giving and sharing your time, your effort, your energy, and your resources. And as you're doing that, doing that from the middle way where you're not depleting your resources, you need to be whole in order for you to be able to sustain yourself in the world. So all everything needs to be practiced from the middle way. Okay. Joshua saying thank you here. All right. All right. So let's go on. So eliminating central desire. You're going to need to guard the doorways to discontent and is practicing mindfulness. The Buddha gives this great analogy of a turtle. He talks about this turtle that is walking along the side of a lake. And this turtle sees a jackal in the distance. And this jackal is hunting for food. And he says, just like the turtle needs to pull in its limbs and protect itself from the jackal, you need to do the same thing. 
because a turtle has six limbs. It has its head. It has its four you know, limbs, its, its legs and arms, and then it has its tail. It has six limbs, right? So just like the turtle pulls its uh, limbs in to protect itself, it says you need to do the same thing when you see the jackal. And the jackal in this story that the Buddha shares, it also saw the turtle. So the turtle sees the jackal, the jackal sees the turtle, the turtle pulls its limbs in and the jackal waits and it's sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the turtle to come out. But the turtle never comes out and eventually the jackal loses interest and it goes away. And now the turtle can come out and it can go about its merry day. So it's the same thing is that if you contract your limbs, if you pull in your sense bases, guarding the mind with the mindfulness, eventually the craving is going to go away. It's going to lose interest in you, right? So this is an analogy that the Buddha uses. So whenever you're extending your neck, whenever you're extending your craving, desire, attachment through these six sense bases, this is where you're subjected to having discontentedness. But when you can draw that in and protect your six sense bases, this is where you can maintain your contentedness. So it's this breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity that's going to help you to eliminate the craving desire attachments. And you're going to need to restrain the mind in the moment, getting better and better at noticing those bodily sensations, right? It, you're going to experience some conditioned feelings on your way to enlightenment, but more and more, you would like to catch it sooner and sooner. That breathing mindfulness meditation, you're developing your mindfulness. You can get to the point where you slow the mind down so much that I saw some of those bodily sensations last for almost eight seconds or 10 seconds, where you get this really elongated time to be able to cut off and let go of any discontentedness. Right now, you might not be noticing the bodily sensations. It might just be whoom right into a feeling. But if you're meditating enough and you're practicing generosity enough, you can slow down the mind where you're starting to notice one or two or three seconds of bodily sensations before the mind becomes discontent. But you can even slow it down further. I noticed one time, like I said, up to about eight or 10 seconds that there were some bodily sensations there giving you the opportunity to take action and cut that off. So get better and better at noticing those bodily sensations. This is ongoing training in meditation, but also outside of meditation. Getting to enlightenment is almost like a full-time job that you would like to apply effort and energy to working on this in a full-time job. You need to distance yourself from the object and then internally cut off the uh, craving, desire, attachment. <clears throat> and then, as I shared the other day, some of these cravings, desires, attachments, as you're distancing yourself from the object, you can notice the pressure building up in the mind. And just like a dam is closed and the water builds up the pressure, and the way to eliminate the pressure is to open the dam, that's the way that they save the dam, they protect the dam from not being damaged, they open the dam and they let some of the water out. And then once the water goes down, then they close the dam again, right? You might notice this, like that's what I noticed when I first started getting rid of coffee. I would notice that um, after two or three days, I really wanted to have a coffee really badly. And you can continue to try to work to get four days, five days, six days, you can surely do that. But if you're noticing a whole lot of pressure in the mind, you're just, uh, your mind's just really agitated. Sometimes just give it what it wants. Just give it a little bit of coffee, right? So now you've gone to three or four days of no coffee, give it a little bit of coffee, right? But now that you've gotten to three or four days, now try to make it seven days or eight days or 10 days. And then if you feel, oh, you feel that pressure coming up, give it a little bit of coffee if that's what it needs. Okay, so now you got 10 days under your belt, now try to make it 14 or 16 or 18 days. Make it wider and wider and wider. You can do this with all the different cravings, desires, attachments in your mind. Sometimes just give the mind a little bit about what it wants because sometimes your mind can feel so discontent that it's making life kind of feel pretty miserable. So just give it a little bit, but then get right back into it and now try to elongate the amount of time that you're not with that particular object so that your craving can gradually be eliminated that way. So you need to protect the mind and you need to protect your contentedness by sometimes just giving the mind a little bit of what it wants. If you try to go cold turkey on these things, that's why usually when you do that, it doesn't work. You usually try to go cold turkey five days into your new year's resolution. Next thing you know, you're right back doing that thing again because cold turkey doesn't work. The same way of saying the mind craves permanence is to say that the mind does not like impermanence. It doesn't like change. 
whenever you're changing things in your life, your mind doesn't like this. So that you can do small little incremental changes. It's almost like the mind doesn't recognize it. It doesn't even recognize that that's what you're doing. So you would like to kind of slowly but surely incrementally make changes. So if you're interested in moving to a plant-based food supply, I don't suggest you say, all right, from today forward, I'm never going to eat meat right? Like that's unwise because your mind's going to have sensual desire, craving that flavor through the tongue, craving a certain texture. So what you do is you maybe eat meat for one day and then one day you don't eat meat. One day you eat meat, one day you don't eat meat. One day or one meal you eat meat, one meal you don't. One meal you eat meat, one meal you don't. And then gradually expand. So now one meal you eat meat, two or three days you don't eat. One meal or one day you eat meat, Two or three days you don't. And you just kind of gradually expand it to the point where the mind almost doesn't even notice this impermanence that you're bringing into its life. So if you do small incremental changes, this will tend to be more comfortable for you because you've allowed the mind to get pleasant feelings based on certain cravings, desires, attachments. As you're letting go of these cravings, desires, attachments, you're going to experience the painful feelings. You're going to have to walk through the fire to appreciate the fresh air on the other side. You're going to get these painful feelings. So if you can do this incrementally and slowly, it'll be more comfortable for the mind. So that is what I would advise for you is that as you feel the pressure coming up, you're going to need to open the dam sometimes and just give the mind a little bit about what it wants. Okay. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, sorry, I have a lot of questions today. Okay. Uh, uh, what happened in the with the attachment with people, like instance, your family, your partner? How do you work with the attachment without, I don't know, uh, saying goodbye forever? Yeah, there's many ways that you can do this. I actually teach an entire class on this in the Armenian Relationships course. Uh, and I've recorded that because there's lots of things you need to do to eliminate an attachment to a person. But I'll just give you a couple of those now. Um, let's just say it's a life partner. And let's just say you guys sleep in the same bed together every day. You see each other a whole lot. Your mind's attached to them. They're attached to you. One of the things you can do is start sometimes sleeping apart every once in a while. Sometimes we attribute sleeping apart as somebody's angry, somebody's mad, somebody's in the doghouse, so to speak. That doesn't have to be the case, right? Your partner can sleep in one bed, you can sleep in another bed. Because if you know that you've been with a partner before, if they go on a business trip or you go on a business trip, you find it very challenging to sleep by yourself to get asleep because the mind's attached to this person sleeping next to you. So if you can introduce some impermanence there, that will help you. Going on holidays alone sometimes, this can help you. The ultimate thing to eliminate attachment to a human being, to a person, is doing something we call reflection of death or contemplation of death, where you sit somewhere, you close your eyes, you kind of envision that this person has died, like maybe the doctors have called you up, maybe a police officer has visited you and told you some news that this person has died. And you essentially convince the mind that this has occurred. You can do this for your life partner, your parents, your children. You convince the mind that they've actually died. And now you're like a fly on the wall and you're kind of going through their funeral, their burial, all the different things. You're confronting this death because that's the biggest amount of permanence that you can experience in a relationship. And that's where the mind will typically grieve when someone has died. But if you do this reflection on death, you might notice 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you're doing this reflection on death. You might notice grief and sadness and sorrow come into the mind. And that's because you're triggering the attachment. You're triggering the craving that you're wanting this being to be permanent. And now you might be sorrowful for a few hours or a few days. But as you cut that off and cut that off and cut that off, like eventually the mind's going to regain its contentedness. <clears throat> and now when it regains its contentedness, maybe a week, two, three, four later, do it again. And you do it again and again. You keep doing this until you get to the point where you sit down to reflect on death 
and you've accepted that, yes, this person's going to die and that's understandable. They are impermanent in my life and I'm going to enjoy the time that I spend with them, but I'm not going to be attached to them. So these are a couple of the things that you can do. Reflection on death is the ultimate way to eliminate an attachment to somebody. And as I did this for my mom and my grandmother, I came out of that realizing that if they had really truly died, there were certain things that I had never said to them that I would regret having not said, and I wouldn't have been able to say it to them because they'd actually been dead. And there were certain things that I needed to hear from them. And there were certain questions that I needed to ask them that I would have never asked them if they were truly dead. So after I did this reflection on death, I called them up on the phone, which was really nice because if they really had died, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So I called them up on the phone. I was like, mom, I've always been meaning to tell you. And by the way, I've been meaning to ask you this question. And I asked them a couple of things, right? And then I got to the point where any time after that, I felt like it was bonus time. I had already convinced myself that my mom had died. I already convinced myself that my grandmother had died. I wasn't aspiring for their death. I wasn't wanting them to die. I had just convinced the mind that they had died. So then all the time after that, it felt like bonus time because I did this in my early 20s and my mom didn't die until 2017. So that was about, I don't know, 25 years or so of all this bonus time. And I noticed my time around them was very different after I had done those reflections of death because I wasn't craving for them to be a certain way. I was, wasn't was putting my expectations on them and it felt like all this bonus time. So these are some of the things that you can do in order to eliminate your attachments. Um, you're going to need to know what true love is so you can practice true love because sometimes people think that the way to get to enlightenment is eliminate all your relationships because they look at the Buddha's life that he left his family and they think, oh, that's what you need to do in order to get to enlightenment. But what they don't understand is that he did come back after he got to enlightenment and he spent time with his son, his wife, his stepmother. They all ordained with him and they all got to enlightenment. So you don't need to end your relationships in order to get to enlightenment. You just need to understand how to have a relationship without attachment, which is going to include you not putting your expectations on someone and controlling someone. And then if you're sleeping with somebody side by side, training your mind that sometimes you'll sleep together, sometimes you won't. Sometimes you'll sleep together, sometimes you won't and things like this. Um, so the reflection on death is the best way to do that and really approach it and confront this death because it's going to happen regardless. Either you're going to die or they're going to die. It's going to happen one way or another. And you can either allow death to sneak up on you or you can confront death on your own terms when you're ready to confront it. And what getting to enlightenment is, among other things, is taking control of your life, taking control of this mind, you making decisions that create certain outcomes that are wholesome for you. So you can allow death to sneak up on you and catch you by surprise, or you can take control of your own life and say, you know what, this person's going to die eventually. I'm going to die eventually. Let me now do this. And now I'm going to confront death on my terms rather than allowing death to sneak up on me. And you can do this for yourself too. contemplate your own death. And this will help you to eliminate any fear that you might have of death, that you can put the mind in the situation that it doesn't want to be in, which is confronting your own death, because we're all going to die. Every single one of us, it's only a matter of time. So if you can confront this death for your own death, you can eliminate your own fear of death that by the time you get to enlightenment, you won't even fear your own death. Yeah, you're welcome. By the way, you don't need to apologize for asking questions. If you're ever studying with a teacher who gets angry at you asking questions, you probably should find a new teacher. <laughs> All right. All right. So it's break time. So it's uh, 1136. So when we come back from break, I'm going to teach you guys dependent origination. This is the highest, most ultimate truth of the teachings of the Buddha. This is where you're going to learn the detailed teachings of exactly why your mind is experiencing discontentedness and why you're experiencing rebirth. There's 12 interlinking steps that you can learn. You can re reflect on and you can see the truth of how discontentedness is being experienced. Right now you understand craving, desire, attachment, but there's much more to it than just craving, desire, attachment. So this teaching that I'm going to share with you, I will share it with you after break. So if we can take a 15 minute break, come back at 1150, then I'll share that with you at that point. And then after we learn that, then we'll uh, take our lunch break and go on our excursion for today. All right, so enjoy your break, and we'll see you guys in 15 minutes, okay? All right, we'll see you guys. All right.
Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.